All right. So um, I'm not going to have you discuss this questions about meteorite, but we've we talked about meteorites last week. And so I just want you to think over again that when we um, date radio um, meteorites with radioactive dating, we find that most of them are four and a half billion years old. So just recall, bring to mind, what is the significance of that number? All right, so hopefully you recall that four and a half billion years is about the same age as our solar system. So primitive meteorites that have not been differentiated, these are essentially raw materials from the very beginning of the formation process of the solar system. So these sort of raw materials are really interesting to look at because this is kind of the only way that we have to tell how old the solar system is. All right, so um, we can kind of talk about making the solar system as if it's a recipe. I just finished watching the Great British Bake Off last night, so I've got recipes in mind. So essentially what we do is start with some set of ingredients, um, mostly gas of hydrogen and helium, and then dust, ices, metals, and rocky material. And then we're gonna mix those together, spin them out into a flat disc, cool the disc, collide the bits that freeze out, and then ignite the star. So I'm gonna walk through each of these steps here. Um, but first, um, recall, which of these ordering is the correct one for going from most material in the solar system to least? All right. So we know that the vast majority of the material in our solar system is hydrogen and helium. So we should be somewhere between four and five. And it turns out that rocks and metals are the least abundant type of material, even though that's primarily what our own planet is made of. So when we look at the solar system composition in terms of like individual objects, most of the solar system's mass is contained within the sun, 99.8% of the solar system's mass. And the sun is 92% hydrogen, 7.8% helium, and trace amounts of everything else. So that means that the vast majority of all the mass in the solar system is tied up in the sun as hydrogen and helium. Then even when we look at some of the other large objects in our solar system, Jupiter and Saturn, the gas giants, those are also mostly hydrogen and helium. So they have largely the same composition as the sun. So for this reason, we think that the entire solar nebula, the cloud that formed that initial solar system was mostly composed of a similar breakdown of materials as the sun and Jupiter. So we start with our ingredients, mostly hydrogen and helium, about 1.4% ices and about 0.4% everything else. And what we're gonna do next is mix those together in what we call the solar nebula, basically just a giant cloud. Um, and eventually this cloud, it has some initial rotation it has you know, pockets of material that maybe are a little bit denser. Maybe there are some pockets that are a little less dense. And for whatever reason, there's some sort of trigger. Maybe it's one of those little pockets of more dense materials that starts gathering together. And the gravity, as that starts to occur, causes the entire cloud to collapse. So as the cloud collapses, it spins into a um, disk. So you can think of this as, you know, if you throw a pizza dough, you're going to form a disk of material. Um, as this flattens out, we're gonna form our sun at the middle and the rest of the disk around is the, um, the protoplanetary disk where our planets will form. So this entire process flattening out into a disk depends on a couple of concepts. The first one is angular momentum. So this basically tells us how strong is the rotation for some object. Um, I won't get into the exact physics here, but it depends on the size of your object, the shape of your object, and how the mass is distributed within it, and then also on the rotation speed of that object. So um, angular momentum as an overall quantity is bigger when you're spinning faster. Um, it's bigger when there's more mass far away from the central rotation point. And a good example of this is 
an ice skater. So a rotating ice skater has some amount of angular momentum. And once they have a certain amount, then that doesn't change over time. It's what we call a conserved quantity in physics. So the, the parts that make it up, such as the rotation speed and the distribution of mass, so the shape of the ice skater's body, those can change, but the total amount of angular momentum does not. And you're probably familiar with this concept, whether you have ever thought about it or not, right? So let me just ask you to get you thinking about it. If an ice skater pulls their arms closer to their body, what happens to their rotation speed? Yeah, as they pull arms closer to their body, then their rotation speed will get faster. And so this is a pretty familiar concept with an ice skater, but the same exact principle applies to our solar nebula as well. As it started to collapse, more and more mass was getting concentrated toward the central point of rotation. And so that caused the entire cloud to spin faster and faster um, as it collapsed. So um, as this occurred, that means that the parts making it up, the mass distribution, of the solar nebula got smaller so that the rotation speed got larger. And this leads us to the second physical principle that governs our solar system formation. And that is called rotational flattening. So the faster and faster that you spin an object, um, that causes the sort of equator of the object to be pushed outwards. Um, a, an example of this is that Earth is actually wider at its equators by about 21 kilometers on a, uh, let's see, diameter of around 6,000 kilometers. So faster rotation in general causes objects to sort of squash down. And that's exactly what happened in our solar system nebula. Um, the central object remained spherical over time, but everything else flattened out into a disk. We've seen this before, so just for fun here, do you remember the name of this object, this dwarf planet that rotates fast and is therefore very much not a sphere? Okay, this was just to see if you remembered. Um, this one was actually Haumea. So Ceres and Eris, Maumea, Haumea, Maki, Maki, and Pluto, those are all dwarf planets. Remember Ceres and Eris are in the asteroid belts. The rest of these are in the Kuiper belt. All right, so that's just an example of rotational flattening. 